We're going. Okay, we let me see. Start. You pull it out of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about Burt Reynolds. Right off the bat, yeah, without well, even a warm up. Well, well, I think that might warm you up a little <laughs> bit myself. <laughs> well, let's see. When I left Moab in the '60s, it was about '69, which was right after the movie Fade In had be, been filmed here, starring Burt Reynolds. And I was working for the uh, commissioner uh, over the police department at the time, and the chief secretary said, how could you stand it to be down in Moab? There isn't anybody to date down there or to go with. There are no men around, are there? And I said, well, yeah, there's, there's quite a few. And I said, for example, I dated Burt Reynolds when I was down there. She about fell off her chair. <laughs> it was an experience. He was a really neat guy, and nothing at all like what they talk about in the, in the media. He had a life plan, he was goal-oriented, and I've watched him fulfill most of his goals, which has been very interesting. Uh, when he was in Moab, he played a, a Moab rancher who fell in love with the editor of a movie being filmed in Moab. And that they filmed the two movies together, so they were back and forth, and, and it was quite interesting from that aspect. And then, of course, when, when the movie was over, she left, and he, he stayed in, in uh, Moab and their lives went in two separate directions. <laughs> but it was a fun experience. So what would you do with him? Well, we Besides, went... Besides... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, one date we had, we went to the, the old drive-in theater, which was kind of neat. And it was a, a movie starring John Wayne. And it was wagon something or other where they were hauling uh, nitroglycerin, I believe, in the wagon, but I don't remember too much about the movie. I've seen it since on the Late Late Show, and I've gotten a little bit more out of it. <laughs> but wagon it was a neat experience. Uh, no, it, Wagon Master was our first movie here in Moab. This was uh, War Wagons. War Wagons, that's what it was. Yeah. So, um, I would say that that was worth being in Moab for. You don't have too much trouble on finding neat guys to date in Moab. Talk a little bit about the film commission, just so we get a little bit of an idea of what you do here. And well, why don't we back up a little bit and talk about my background that brought me here. And uh, <clears throat> although I was born in Colorado, I was raised in, in Kanab, Utah, which was known as Little Hollywood at the time through the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And uh, so there was only about a thousand population there at the time. In fact, Moab and Kanab were like twin cities, both wrapped in red rocks. and and uh, very beautiful, but with only like a thousand people if you counted dogs, chickens, and, and people. And in fact, at that particular time, my father, who was sort of into everything, decided to form Canab Pictures Corporation, and they did a movie called Stallion Canyon. So not only was I in a lot of movies as uh, extra or stand-in, I did a stand-in for uh, Arlene Dahl in a movie called The Outriders with Joe McRae, which was quite a, an experience. She was having an operation at the time, and couldn't get to location. It was unexpected, so I took everything but lines and close-ups, which was kind of an extra opportunity. So that was a neat experience. And with that kind of background, um, well, I, when I used to visit Moab, I have a lot of relatives in Moab, and when I used to visit Moab, I'd, they'd always be curious about the movies, and that was before the movies started being filmed here. And so on The Outriders, when I was doubling for Arlene Dahl, <coughs> the uh, uh, Boy from the Yearling, the movie The Yearling, was on there, and we were both about 15 at the time. So that was kind of a neat experience. And they, they couldn't, um, Claude German Jr. was his name, and they didn't really believe me. Well, it was only a couple of years after that, it was about a year after that, that they um, filmed Wagon Master here in Moab, and they started learning what it was like to have movies in your own town. And then the following year, when they did uh, Rio Grande with John Wayne and John Ford, Claude Jarman Jr. played John Way's son. So uh, all my cousins and stuff here in Moab got acquainted with him just like I did down there, which was kind of a neat experience. And uh, my Uncle George is uh, white, 
is the founder of the Film Commission here. Uh, they did a lot of the filming on his ranch on the Colorado River. And so when I moved here in the 60s, uh, they were doing, that's, that's when Burt Reynolds came in on Fade In and they were doing the movie Blue, which is the one they were fading into. Uh, I worked on some pictures then, and then I moved back in about 82, I guess, and, and of course by that time, George had gotten pretty well up in years, and, and the industry was moving faster, and everybody had to have everything done yesterday, so little by little he was slowing down, and, and uh, he and Bud Lincoln, they were sort of partners really, really promoting it at the time, along with the rest of the, the movie committee or film committee at that time. and. Uh, because I was related to George and so forth, it was kind of a natural with my prior experience to work into it, and I started out by getting on the, the film board. And um, at that particular time, they had no office. Uh, the Travel Council secretary would occasionally get letters and things out for them, but mostly they were working it out of their hip pocket, which made it very difficult, and it was hard to keep up with, with the competition when that was going on. Um, from the early times when they really had it going, where you could go to the Hollywood studios and, and sell them on the area to come out here, things had decentralized and people were all over. You couldn't go far enough, fast enough, to reach everybody that you were trying to promote to get in here, so it was a whole changing picture. And um, the first thing I did is I did a, a grant that I, I noticed that well, let me, let me back up a little bit. I hit town about the time that the bottom fell out of the mining industry. And there was a 20% decline in population within just a few months when this started happening. The domino effect was profound. Uh, the mines shut down, hundreds lost their jobs, and, and the repercussions from the whoever they did business with went on down the line until we had 20% loss of population. We still were probably barely back up to what we were in 1980 now. <laughs> so, um, I looked around and saw that we had all of these economic development organizations like the, uh, there was Grand County Economic Development, there was the Chamber of Commerce, there was Convention Bureau, Film Commission, all of this going on, but nobody really had a home. So, I did a grant through Community Block Grant to house and have an office that served all of these organizations. And then that's where we started with the uh, actually having a real live office. And, and over the next few years, one at, <coughs> excuse me, one at a time would phase out and go out on their own when they develop strength again and get their own place. And um, then at one point, after four years of grant funding, uh, the Grand County assumed the office. And at that time, it was just the Film Commission and Grand County Economic Development. And so through grants and, and different things, we were able to continue with trying to keep up with the Joneses on getting promotional pieces, brochures, the photographs that it takes to get out all of the, the photo presentations to sell the people and compete with other locations. And little by little, uh, we started building up speed again. One of the problems is when the Westerns went over the hills and faded out of the pictures, uh, the industry had Moab pegged as purely a western location, so we had a whole new um, siege to do on, say, say, selling them on the fact that this was excellent for adventure movies or for uh, galactic pictures with the outer space theme. We have a lot of wonderful country around that can duplicate that. And so, little by little, things started improving and, and the word got out. It takes time and it takes lots of repetition and it takes lots of grapevine work to, to really, the two things, because we are so remote that's hard, while we have beautiful country, they are first worried about getting here because it's so remote and secondly, they don't want to have to bring in the world, they want to be able to hire crew where they're at so they don't have to pay per diem and it's taken an awfully lot to sell the industry on the fact that we have really professional crew, crew people here. And they're really good because um, this is their backyard. They know how to deal with it. Uh, people come out from Hollywood and get clear out in the middle of nowhere and where they don't have everything at their fingertips and they find it quite difficult. So uh, it's been a sales job all the way and it still is because we're very remote. We always have the hump of having to say this is to get over, that this is worth it, you know, to come to pay the extra expense to get here. 
<clears throat> you mentioned George White. I don't want to do as much about George as we can. Um, Just memories of George. And well, you know, I don't have a lot of memories. Uh, uh, most of the things that I've gotten are, are the stories that he has told. And uh, I, I know that the things that I've researched as far as, as the history goes, but as far as actually being there and experiencing with George, I haven't, because he more or less faded out when I, when I moved into the picture. And I know that he's well thought of in the industry. Uh, a lot of old timers will occasionally come in. We had one on that was the original uh, uh, production designer. He didn't wind up being the one, but was the original with the scouting party for Riders of the Purple Sage. And he made it a point to go up and visit George and, and reminisce over all the things that, that had happened on the different movies he had been here before. As it turned out, they had another one come because he didn't want to be away from home that long. But it's amazing how many people that we still deal with today that remember George and have worked here on pictures with him. Uh, when I go down to Location Expo, which is a trade show to sell your location that's in uh, L.A. and Hollywood each year, uh, it's amazing how many people still come up and want to know how George is doing and if he's still around. And of course, because of George is why we have the status as the longest ongoing film commission on earth. And we are way, way out ahead of most. Um, we are in our 46th anniversary, and probably, if there's a, the closest one, maybe 26 years, and that would be a state film commission, probably Colorado. And uh, so we're pretty proud of that. And had it not been for George and his stick to itness, uh, we wouldn't have this status. Every little bit like that helps when you're trying to compete with the rest of the world. And it is a world trade now. I mean, wherever we go, we may be competing with Iraq or Iran or Scotland or somewhere else uh, on any of the scenes that we do here. And we have an awfully lot of foreign trade come in here to film clear from their country. So it's definitely a world competition, and you've got to keep on your toes to stay with it. <clears throat> Listen to that bird, isn't I that know, neat? That's amazing. What is it? I don't know, but I hope it stays with us. One of the neatest stories I've ever heard about uh, Carl, I think, is when I was talking to Sam Taylor one day, uh, who was the editor of our paper here, and his father before him was the editor of the Times Independent. And he was recalling when uh, he, he was a young, probably a senior or something in high school, with a friend, and they had been uh, down the Colorado River on a boat. The boat broke down, or they ran out of gas or something. and and. Uh, it started just pouring down rain, sheet rain, just really coming down thick. And they were all panicked, wondering what in the world they were going to do and how anybody was going to find them. And they had found a little bit of shelter and were all huddled in along the rims of the Colorado down there. And all of a sudden, right out of all of this storm, came this booming voice just singing to the top of its lungs as Carl Tangren come sailing down the river on, in his little barge or whatever he had, and they were saved. And they said never had they heard such a wonderful sight or, or seen such a wonderful sight or heard such a wonderful noise in their life. So that was kind of a, I, I can just see Carl doing that. He's, he's such a character and has such a voice to boom out there in the first place. But it shows his nature as far as not even a storm will slow him down. His spirits are always up and always there, so that was a neat story. And uh, Rusty and uh, I, I had a neat thing happen. The first time I ever met Rusty, uh, Tex and Millie were doing a trial run with their 60-passenger jet boat, and they were taking some, some local people and, and friends to try it out for the first time, do a maiden run from Moab to Green River which is about 100 miles. It took us 10 hours to get there. But uh, it was really an experience. And um, 
Rusty was on that. That's when I first met him. And this was only, what, maybe five or six years ago, six or seven, eight. I lose track of time. Anyway, uh, we were, oh, probably 15 miles this side of Green River, somewhere in there. And up ahead was this calf that was drowning in the water. On one side, it was a straight uh, sandstone cliff. And on the other side, it was a thicket of, of uh, tamarisk trees. And over here next to the cliff was this little calf that was struggling for its life. Well, <clears throat> Tex cut the engine and tried to maneuver in. But because of the, the jet boat, the, it caused waves and panicked the calf even more. So he kept maneuvering until he could get in by it. And of course, the calf was just fighting for everything it was worth. It was clear out of its head. And I don't know what we would have done had Rusty not been there that day, because he has the confidence and he has the know-how. So he, we pull up as close as we can get. And of course, the, from the water to the top of the boat was a pretty good reach. And uh, he leans over, and it takes a little bit. But by that time, I think uh, Tex uh, stalled the boat out so that we could sit there. And he went down to help, and the two of them reached over. and grabbed hold of that calf, which was a fairly good-sized calf, and managed to wrestle it into the, to the boat with the 60 people, which you could then have another catastrophe. And so Tex immediately hogtied it so that it couldn't move, and it laid right up at the front of the boat while we brought it on into Grand Junction. And it would have surely died had we not come along, because there was just no place for it to get out. It would have worn itself out and drowned. That's all there was to it. So. They brought it in, and then they called the authorities to find out who it belonged to, and it managed to get its little life saved. But that was my first encounter with Rusty. So he's been quite an experience ever since. <laughs> Tex and Millie? Uh, Tex and Millie, um, for several years, and I don't know if they still do it or not, but they have... Um, Ooh, there's a neat hummingbird down there. <laughs> Look at it. Isn't that neat? Um, okay, Tex and Millie. <clears throat> My acquaintance with them was that uh, they invited me to their place when they had a Grand Circle tour where they invited, uh, where they had the Grand Circle organization would invite numerous uh, media people. <clears throat> Let me start that over again. Uh, <laughs> okay, it gives me a little bit of time to, to okay. get a better, a better shot here. Try to stay right where you are. Okay. I'm, do, I'm doing a close up. So. This is such a marvelous atmosphere. I know. Isn't this the perfect temperature? Oh. And totally still, everything, you know. It's just beautiful. Uh, Tex and Millie uh, invited me to their place for the Grand Circle Tour uh, celebration that they would have when the, the organization brought media people in from all over the world. And they, I was invited, of course, because at that time I was director of all of these organizations that we taught, the economic development organizations and promotion and so forth. And uh, I was absolutely overwhelmed at their place. I think they have one of the most unique homes that I've ever seen in my life. And so did everybody else that was there. <laughs> it always causes quite a stir. People are just in disbelief, and it's always fun to watch their reaction when they come in. Uh, Tex and Millie are two of the most vital people I think I have ever known. They're totally always, they always appear totally happy and jubilant and energetic and everything that goes with it. And uh, I have highly admired everything they do, and I love their home. Um, I don't know if you took a tour of it or anything, but uh, 
<clears throat> like the Anasazi bathroom with a shower, <laughs> where you go in through the, the little tea cut door like the Anasazi do. And uh, I love the wagon hanging from the ceiling in that fireplace. They would always have uh, this bluegrass band that actually was staged on top of the fireplace. The fireplace was so big. And then they would have this dance before the night was over and everybody kicked up their heels. And the, the bluegrass music really made you want to kick up your heels. And I, I have fond memories of those parties there. They were always wonderful. They're great entertainers. Millie cooks the most fabulous uh, Navajo tacos, which everybody loves. And uh, as I recall, she also sings. And when you put Tex and Millie on the dance floor, can they cut a rug? <laughs> so they're, they're just pretty neat people. They're some of the very special ones of our community, I think. Well, um, Verl is certainly one of our old timers. He was a sheriff down in San Juan County and has some pretty wild tales to tell about that. And uh, he's, he's a natural for the movies when they come in because he has such a classic look, especially for the rugged westerns. And uh, I know we, last November, October, I think it was, October, November, we did a, a IMAX movie called uh, The Great American West. They did a segment here for the pioneers that were first into this country and went through Hole in the Rock. And he had just purchased a team of Belgian horses, and uh, particularly for the movie industry, so that he could rent them. He was, he's been working up props and things like that, wagons and so forth. And so he got his wagon and his, his Belgian horses into the movie, and he was the, the wagon driver in the, in the scene. So they had this one, uh, the wagons coming through Ida Gulch, which is definitely a John Ford, John Wayne look to it. And so when they yelled, okay, cameras roll, and they started the team going, he, it was, he hadn't worked with his Belgians too much. And boy, they started out, and he was trying to hold on to them. They pulled him right over the front of the wagon. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt, but it was... He was cussing them, I'll tell you. And he knew he had a little bit of work to do with them because they're pretty big horses to try to control if you haven't, you know, practiced with them and worked with them a little bit. So he was about to get rid of them after that, but I think he's hung in there, I hope, because they're darn good stock for, for your Western-type themes. Mm -hmm. on, on this uh, recent one for uh, Cheyenne, I was scouting with the director and the producer, that's a western too, and Cheyenne is the name of the girl in the movie. And we were coming up the uh, Potash Schaefer Trail Road, and ahead of us was a cowboy with a few cattle. And the director immediately uh, sparked up, and, and we pulled up, I said, oh, that's Verl Green. We pulled up to the side, and I talked to him for a minute. When we pulled away, the director said, I have to have him in the movie. He is classic. I have to have him in the movie. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> I just wish somebody would give him a speaking part. All right. Well, it's tough, though, you know. It's, it's, it's tough. But I, did did, he, did he not have any in Cheyenne? Because they were going to give him one in he Cheyenne. Said, I asked him about if he ever had a speaking part, and he said, they always ask me if I'm uh, in the guild. Oh well, yeah. But if they have if they have a part going, they can uh, Taft Hartley. You, you know, if you haven't been in the Screen Actors Guild before, and I mean, we have a lot of people around Moab that got in the guild that way. So there's a way. But I think that there wasn't a particular part. You know, in that they would have had to create something with the lines and so forth. So. We've had uh, quite a battle here the last few years as far as uh, the permitting situation is concerned for filming. I always felt so proud because I thought filming is one thing that doesn't do damage to the environment. And uh, as I watched the uh, movement, the environmental movement, uh, get on top of the, the cattle industry and the uh, oil and mining and all of that and and little by little things were shut down and times changed I thought well at least we have the film industry 
because it's always been a savior through southeastern Utah during hard times. Uh, southeastern Utah is known as a boom and bust area, especially Moab. And during the hard times, it's been film that has come in and given us payrolls that have pulled us through. And a lot of your local merchants have said, um, if it hadn't been for the movies, we wouldn't have our bills paid because maybe people had run up bills for months and they hadn't been able to pay them. That was back at the cash and carry, whatever uh, system that they used to have. And then after a movie was over, they'd come in and pay all their bills off. So it's been economically very valuable to this community over the years. Um, the very fact that it was so light on the environment, and by light I mean, first of all, they're under a microscope when they come in here. They have to uh, be monitored. They have, have to reclaim anything. If they've, they've had horses or cattle in, they have to rake the ground. And, and if they have done any disturbance at all, they have to replant it. And um, they move around a lot. Maybe they only shoot a half a day here, or a quarter of a day there, and sometimes maybe a day or two. Or even if it's a major key set that they built there, they have to take it clear back to its original state or better. And the very fact that it is moved all over, I mean, they're never anywhere for very long. And always new locations they come up with, too. So you aren't having a hard ongoing impact on anything. And they've spent a good deal of money on archaeological uh, uh, studies to be sure that there's no archaeological sites in the area where they're filming or wildlife studies. All of these things they've paid for, and, and many of the archaeological sites have been discovered because of studies that they've had to pay for, uh, that there's another money to discover, which I think is kind of neat. So when things got tougher, that what we're dealing with right now is that the Department of Interior, Bureau of Land Management, decided to write into their policy land which had only been proposed as wilderness. Now, we have never been able to film in wilderness areas in the first place. Uh, only a couple of times have we managed any filming in, in uh, wilderness study areas, and that was only in Westwater Canyon on the Colorado River, which you can't do much damage on the Colorado River. Um, once they realized this was going on with the environmental movement, they even kiboshed that, so we don't film at Westwater anymore. And so now when, first of all, it started with the Wayne Owens Wilderness Bill, which is basically what H.R. Uh, 1500 is now. The Department of Interior BLM wrote into their policy all of these additional restrictions if you want to film in an H.R. 1500 area. Now, a good deal of the 1500 area is wilderness, and I have no battle with that. But so have they. They also have Professor Valley, which is what we refer to as John Ford Country. And it's the area between Fisher Towers and the Priest and the Nuns in Castle Rock to the south. Almost everything that's ever filmed in this area has done some shots in Professor Valley. Ida Gulch is part of that, and that's a very popular film location. The 1500 takes in all of that area. Now, my complaint here is Professor Valley has a scenic highway running through the middle of it. And from this highway, there are numerous graveled roads and dirt roads that run to the sides on both east and west. At the end of those roads are homes and ranches and farms. This is not wilderness. I mean, we're only talking a few. The stretch of the scenic road there and where they film is probably five miles, six to eight miles at the most. That's all we're talking. And it's only like 19 to 25 miles from Moab. It's only probably six miles from Castle Valley. And it has all of this inhabitants in it, that is not wilderness. That is not wilderness. And yet, because it's in 1500, we have to go through all of these extra um, requirements, which means if somebody wants to film there, they're lucky if, if they can get a permit through in less than 90 days. And by the time they get through with the 90 days, they are restricted to no helicopters minimal livestock, if any, and it has to stay on the trail 
or on the, the roads that are already existing. No motorized anything in there. Now, the thing that's very curious is this is so pristine, they put it in a wilderness bill. And yet, since 1949, we have filmed there every year. Somebody has filmed there. Almost every movie ever filmed here has had film scenes taken in that particular area. Now, if they did so much damage, why is it so pristine that in spite of all the roads and everything else, they still want to call it wilderness? To me, that says film is a good industry for the environment. It does not hurt it. It's <laughs> I lost a train of thought here. I'm going to just stop for a second. Okay. This is John Howard and his land. Oh.